Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Coret in San Francisco Public Library for some of our guests. I'm Kathy Lawhon, Chief of the Main Library, and our, our adult services program for this month does feature a special speaker, uh, Stacy Aldridge, our state librarian. Our own former uh, city librarian, Susan Hildreth, brought Stacy to the state in uh, 2007 as deputy state librarian. And then when she moved on to Seattle, she became an acting. And then she now was appointed by Governor Schwar former Governor Schwarzenegger uh, in 2009. So um, she really has been um, very active in talking to uh, libraries across the state and at conventions to really talk about the future of libraries and how we can, the state library can really help the local libraries. Um, we will have a question and answer uh, after her presentation, so please, I know you're not shy, um, put those questions out there to her. We will have some mics, so wait until you get a mic because we are recording this uh, for presentation on the web so all people in California, all libraries in California can see it. So with that, I'd like to welcome Stacy Aldridge. Well, good morning. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you to Trent Garcia for inviting me to uh, be here with you today. Uh, I'm going to do a little bit of a hodgepodge today, some updates, uh, a little bit about ebooks, and then a little bit about uh, thinking about the future and, and some ideas of what we need to be doing, um, and not necessarily in that order. So, um, first, I want to start with how many of you really know a lot about the State Library? One, two, three, okay. So now you get a commercial from me <laughs> about the uh, State Library here. Uh, does anybody know what year we are established? Anybody? Anybody want to take a guess? 56, 49, right in between, 1850. So uh, we're 161 years old this year. Woohoo! Um, and I hope we can keep going longer than 161 years. Um, um, we do a lot of things at the State Library that people aren't aware. Um, our main three things that we are responsible for really are collecting, preserving, and connecting people. And I think those are three key things that every library does. And how we do that is different. What we collect, what we preserve, and what we connect change over time. Their formats, um, we connect not only things but also people. And so those are the three areas that we, um, we really focus on at the State Library, but we do a lot. So we have a whole information service side. That includes the Braille and Talking Book Library, uh, includes California history. How many of you have heard Gary Kurt speak before? Yeah, he's a great guy. He's really fun to listen to, and he really knows a lot about all the amazing things that we have in our California history uh, collection, including the original map that uh, James Wilson Marshall drew of uh, where he found gold in Sacramento. And it's pretty interesting. It looks like a third, year, a third grader drew it. Um, it's on uh, lined paper with colored pencil, and it's very flat. And uh, he not only drew where he found the gold, but he also drew a, a cartoon at the situation of all hands on deck when he actually found the gold. And so little pop-up bubbles. I found it. Found what? It's shiny. <laughs> <laughs> so I think what I like most about the things that we have in the history collection is not so much that they're things, but the stories that go with those things. And so if you've never been to the State Library, I invite you all, if you know where to find me, I will be happy to take you into the vault to see some of the amazing things that we have. Um, we also have a general information resources uh, group, and we also have uh, a Wiccan Law Library. We are the sub-regional depository for federal documents in the state of California, and so we are the federal depository in California. And then um, we have the Sutro Library here in San Francisco. Who's been to the Sutro? Oh, yay, a couple people. The Sutro is really cool. There's a lot of really great genealogy uh, research from across the country. If you're doing genealogy uh, and you're, you're looking for just California, Sacramento is the place to go, the California history section. If you're looking for a broad, uh, broad spectrum of around the country, then the Sutro is the place to go. Uh, the Sutro not only has the genealogy collection, but also Adolf Sutro's amazing collection of things that he collected uh, when he was around, including uh, a first edition portfolio, a Shakespeare folio, from 1624, which is just, or 1623, 23, 24, um, which is just amazing. Uh, the Bible from Charles the, 
fourth one? Or one of them was executed. <laughs> it was the Bible he had with him before he was executed. That's kind of grim, but um, what's interesting about it is it's, uh, it's made of wood, it's carved, it's engraved, and it's, it's just it's an amazing, amazing piece of work. So we have a lot of great history in the Sutro. But that's not all we do, we're not just a library. We also have library development services, so how many of you have heard of library development services? That's where our library funding, all the folks, that our consultants work with you on different programs like Transforming Life After 50 and uh, programs that help uh, folks go to library school. Then we have a research uh, bureau, the California Research Bureau does uh, research for the legislature on biased research, so they work for the governor's office and the legislature, and they can, usually they get calls about some interest in particular topic that they'll do research. And then we also run three programs. We have the Library Bond Act, um, which we're just winding down. I think we have three more libraries that um, are being finished at this point. And um, that's pretty exciting, um, seeing all the libraries that have been built around the state. Uh, we also have the California Cultural Historical Endowment, which is designed to preserve uh, California history. And it, it's California history from places and history. Uh, so it's helping restore homes, it's helping to create museums. And it's, a, a, again, a bond act, uh, and it winds down in about two years. And the last thing we have is the California Civil Liberties Public Education Program. How many of you have heard of that? Just a few. Ooh. This is a really great program. Um, it's designed to um, support people in capturing the memories of the Japanese American experience um, during World War II. And so we have over 500 recordings that have been made of the Nisei and people who have, uh, were in the internment camps. There are movies that are written uh, or, or filmed. There are books that are, are written. So um, it's a pretty amazing program. And unfortunately, we haven't really posted all the projects. And we're working on that right now so that you can find all the things that have been created. So um, how many of you knew about 25% of what we do? Ah, uh, yeah. 50%? 75% <laughs> of what we do? Ah, good. Well, now you know everything that we do at the California State Library. It's pretty amazing. I'm sure some of you are interested in what's going on with the budget right now. Um, <laughs> uh, so I'm really appreciative that the governor is actually trying to do something, because the budget is really bad, if you've heard. <laughs> it's really bad. Um, and um, there are some hard choices that are being made. Uh, and when the governor's budget came out, this is what we had in three of our library programs. Um, uh, for Public Library Foundation, which was at 12.9 million, it was given a zero. For the California Library Services Act, it was given a zero. And for the California Library Literacy Services uh, program, it was given a zero. CLSA um, is about 12.9 million too, or was, and literacy is about 4.5 million. So that's about 30. Um, over $30 million that um, was eliminated from the budget to support libraries. So what we've been doing is um, just trying to educate folks about what that means to eliminate these programs. And so um, public library, is everybody familiar with what PLF is? Some people know. Um, PLF is uh, state aid to libraries. It was created after uh, Prop 13 passed, and it was a way to ensure that some libraries weren't shutting down because those tax bases were, the tax base was lost um, for many libraries in the state. So PLF um, was uh, Jim Nielsen when he was a senator. Um, and um, our lovely lobbyist, Mike Dillon, <laughs> was part of helping PLF go through. So uh, PLF has been around for a while. The California Library Services Act, is anybody familiar with that? Anybody not familiar with that? Okay. So um, CLSA uh, does two things. It is the underpinnings, the big thing that it does is it's the underpinnings for ensuring equal access in the state of California to resources. So no matter where you live in the state of California, you can get access to resources. So it does two things. It provides a small subsidy to libraries for sharing their resources. So if you um, allow people to come to your library and check out a book, even if they're from another city or another town, then we give you a small subsidy for that. Um, if you do uh, interlibrary loan with other libraries in the state, um, then we give you funding for that. And that's um, only like 29 cents to the dollar, I think, right now. It's very low in what we actually give to you all, but at the same time, it's a subsidy to encourage libraries to share their resources. 
Um, the other thing that it does is it creates eight regional library systems around the state. And those eight regional library systems help to um, leverage resources regionally to provide resources to everybody within that region. And so um, in this area, you have uh, Pacific Library Partnership, um, which does amazing work in wiring up things and databases and training and all those kinds of things. So um, CLSA is really important because it really is ensuring that we have access anywhere in this state, no matter who you are. And we're really concerned about the loss of funding in this particular area because one of the things is if you are playing in CLSA, you can't charge for library cards people who don't live in your, your jurisdiction. And what we have heard already is that people have been thinking about charging for library cards outside their jurisdiction. So as soon as we start charging for library cards, I think that's where we start to break down that equity of access in this state, and so we're a little bit concerned about that. Um, the other program is the California Library Literacy Services, library, library California Literacy Library Services. <laughs> and um, that's a statewide program that is a very focused and targeted literacy program. It's not redundant um, for other literacy programs because it focuses on um, in native English speakers with less than a sixth grade reading average um, and helping them uh, with a tutor, a one-on-one -on -one tutor, to um, get the skills they need to be successful in terms of literacy. And uh, there are 105 library jurisdictions in the state that participate with over 12,000 volunteers um, and 22,000 uh, uh, individuals were served. And if you count their families, because there's a family component, it's about 42,000 people that are served by this program yearly. So um, those are the three programs. And the first one we can completely understand because it is a local assistance and the governor really is looking at how do we turn back more things to uh, the locals in terms of managing. Um, but the other two um, really are sort of the state's commitment to libraries and ensuring, uh, again, that we have equal access and that people do have access because if you can't read, you don't have access. Uh, along with the budget cuts, the one thing, the other thing we're concerned about is our Library Services and Technology Act funding, which how many are you familiar with LSTA? Okay. So every year the state of California gets um, a little over $16 million um, to help support libraries in the state. And we do that through multiple grants, through statewide initiatives. And we have to report a maintenance of effort every year. And that maintenance of effort um, has to stay within a running three-year average of what we've reported in the prior three years. And if we drop, um, what happens is we drop the percentage. Um, our, the, the allotment that we get drops the same percentage as what we've dropped. And so this is our mystical, magical chart that we've been using <laughs> to explain to everybody how it works. Um, but basically, we get a grant every year. The grants are good for two years at a time. So we always have overlapping grants. And we report every year on the previous two years. And we have to report over the two years of the federal, um, federal grant are actually three of our budget years, three of our budget cycles. It's uh, uh, nine months of one year, 12 months of another, and three at the end. It's 24 months. And so we have to show during that time what was the, the state's commitment to libraries through this maintenance of effort. And so this is this year, 2008, 2010. We just reported that. And we could report our full maintenance of effort. The red line that you see drawn here, that actually determines what our allotment is going to be for this year. So it always skips a year. So if we start to lose money now, if we get zeroed out now, um, next year when we report, we will start to see the effects which will then drive our next allotment. And the first, um, the first thing we'll see is a, a minus 19%, which would mean we get about 13 million. But then the following year, if we're still at zero, we're seeing an 82% drop in the federal funds we get, which would be about $2 million, uh, which is really not even enough to run our Braille and talking book program. So um, the concern is what we do now drives years out. And so that's what we've been trying to explain to people that you might not think we need it now, but we're already going to be reporting it, and we can't catch up at a certain point. Um, we can ask for a waiver. Uh, the issue with the waiver is the state has to show that it, um, it has uh, not disproportionately cut the budget of the agency compared to other agencies. And it also has to show that the state has some commitment to libraries. And we're concerned if there's no funding, it's going to be really hard to say that there's commitment to libraries. 
I don't know. <laughs> so that's our concern. Um, and the 16 million is a, a big deal. We do a lot for 16 million dollars. We have some Eureka grads in here. People are Eureka. Who's in Eureka? Raise your hand. Yay. Who was in Eureka? <laughs> um, who are doing amazing projects right now. We're leveraging a lot of really good, interesting, cool projects in the state and doing a lot of good work with that funding. So um, that's sort of the state of a state with a budget. Are there any questions about the budget before I move on? I'm going to wait till the end. Does that all make sense, crystal clear? <laughs> any questions? OK. I can pick them at the end, too. So given, um, given that the budget is so hairy right now, it really behooves us to think about the future. How do we, how do we start planning? How do we take control over what our opportunities are versus waiting for the bus to hit us? So um, some people might think about the future like this, Madam Anna. <laughs> um, this is a, a, a photograph from our collection at the State Library. Um, and many people, I, I used to work for a futuring think tank, and I've worked with futurists for, for years now. And um, I can remember working with clients, and they'd ask me questions that I thought, I am a futurist, not a psychic. This <laughs> when exactly will everybody have a home area network in their house? <laughs> I don't know. When are you going to make something so easy that everybody wants to? <laughs> so, so it's not just about the predictions. It really is about um, kind of paying attention to what's happening in the world. And I'm sure a lot of you already do this. So I just want to talk a little bit about what I've been thinking about and what I pay attention to. And the first thing is I show this postcard all the time. Um, and it's, <laughs> I love this postcard, because everything in her home is waterproof. The housewife of 2000 can do her daily cleaning with a hose. <laughs> so um, she's powering down her plastic furniture um, with a hose. And, and this is supposed to be 2000. And there are a lot of assumptions that are happening in this postcard from the 1950s about what 2000 was going to be. And can any of you just shout out what some of the assumptions are? Housewife, yeah, for sure. Absolutely. I mean, don't you, don't you clean with your apron and your high heels on, all dressed? Plastic, yes, plastics. Uh huh. Any? Water, yes. There's abundant water. You can just hose down everything. Anything else? Yeah, yeah. Like, everything would have to be waterproof. If you think about it, like your, your curtains, everything would have to be waterproof. Anything else? All good, good, good observations. So, so what this brings forth is we have to be very careful about what our assumptions are that we're making about the future. So in this future, they're saying, well, 2000, it's going to be great. Everything's going to be plastic. But it was based on the mental models of that day. And so as we're thinking about the future, it's really important for us to challenge our assumptions. When you get that sort of ooky feeling, like, well, no, that can't ever happen. Not everybody will have a cell phone. You know, 1980, not everybody's going to have a cell phone. Who wants to carry around that big device? The assumption being that the technology is going to stay that big, it's going to stay that expensive. We have to challenge what we think in order to help us think b more broadly about what's going to happen. So I encourage you, as you're talking with each other and you're talking uh, with your friends, to, to challenge each other's assumptions about, about the future. Because this is one, there are several people who didn't challenge their assumptions. I don't know if you can see this, but this is an ice man. So he used to deliver ice to ice boxes. And we had ice boxes instead of actual refrigerators. And there were some companies that saw it coming and moved their ice, their ice uh, manufacturing to the, the business level, away from the home, and they thrived. But those who didn't see refrigeration coming were the ones that didn't thrive. And so there wasn't a challenge of where, where's technology going, what will people have, and how do I gear my business to continue to thrive in the changes that are happening. So we don't necessarily want to be like the Iceman <laughs> as we're thinking about our libraries and about um, what people are going to need or want um, in upcoming years. And how do we be good ancestors now so that we build good foundations for, for the people who are coming behind us in libraries? So um, everybody knows like the future is a straight path, right? <laughs> no, it kind of looks like this. And along the way, there are trends, there are uncertainties, there are wild cards, there are um, th 
things called discontinuities. And these are all terms that futurists use to think about different things. So there are trends. So a trend really is a pattern that you see that is having a long-term effect over time. It's causing something to happen. It's not a fad. It's not like mini skirts, and then it's gone. It's something that you see that slowly plods along but is changing what's happening. That's a trend. An uncertainty is something that you know is going to happen, you're not sure when. So I would say ebooks were an uncertainty for us. How many of you remember the Rocket ebook? Anybody? Or the soft book? <laughs> uh, those were out in the late 90s. And we knew ebooks were coming. We knew there were lots of problems with the uncertainty. Was like, when, is, when is it going to be the tipping point for ebooks? And then you have wild cards. And these are things that could happen. They could. And you want to think about those things. What if this happens? So a wild card could be. Um, uh, 2012, there's supposed to be a huge solar flare off the sun. And the last time we had what they're predicting to be these solar flares, they knocked out power in parts of the country. And um, NASA has even done a study on these solar flares. It's available on the web if you Google solar flares and NASA. <laughs> um, predicting if the solar flares are as bad as they, were, as they were in the previous time, which parts of the country would be affected because it will completely knock out the electricity and, and fry the networks, basically, of electricity. That's a wild card because <laughs> we're not sure. And it's important for us to think about those wild cards. So what if our power goes out in cities? What will the role be of libraries when the power goes out? Is there a role for libraries when the power goes out? That's a wild card. So it's good to kind of pay attention to those things that you see out there. That's a wild card, something that could happen, and then kind of think through what would you do or what, were, what would be the possibilities for what the library could do. And then there are discontinuities, and these are things that happen that change everything. It's a moment in time where something happens and the world is never the same. So can anybody think of anything like that? Google, Google. yeah. We're going along, we're using Yahoo. Yahoo's so great to search. And then Google happened. Boom. Change. OK, what else? Sorry? Twitter? Twitter? Yeah. You know, Twitter is kind of interesting. Twitter was like this little, it was a little trend. <laughs> There's a little social networking happening. Because at first, people were like, eh, Twitter, it's not going to be a big thing. And then it just boomed. So mm -hmm. changed sort of the dynamics of social networking. What else? Facebook. Facebook, yes, absolutely changing the way we think about how we communicate. Mm -hmm. um, I would add things to like 9-11. That's a discontinuity. Boom, changes everything, changes the way we think. So those are discontinuities. So you might hear these words when you're thinking about the future or when people are talking about the future. And you want to consider all of these things when you're together and talking about the future. Because if we start to play with these things in the future, the future is a lot less scary if you've already thought about it. <laughs> Um, and this was a great, um, a great definition. I love Wired Magazine's jargon, jargon Watch. And patternicity, to me, is one of the best. And I'm just going to read it because you can't see it. The tendency to find patterns where there are none. According to a recent study, evolution favors patternicity because it's safer to detect false threat than to ignore a real one and become the boogeyman, a boogeyman's lunch meat. <laughs> and so, so it's really important for us as libraries to pay attention to patterns. Where are the patterns? How are people using us? What are people using when they come into the library? What kinds of um, formats are coming out that are changing the way people get information? How are people changing the way they find and use information? That's patternicity. And so it's, all, it's really important for us all to kind of think in that patternicity mode. And you don't have to do anything extra. It's just about paying attention to what's going on around you. So if we want to be thinkers and creators of the future, which I really believe in, I don't believe um, that we have to sit back and wait for the future to come to us, we need to make sure that we consider the possibilities. So what are all the potential possibilities of something, and even thinking the unthinkable? What if, what if there were no, no paper books anymore? What does a library look like? What if there were no buildings for libraries? What does that look like? Um, we want to find and take advantage of new opportunities. So every time something new is happening, 
We want to figure out what does that mean and how could a library play a part or be a part of um, creating something really cool. And then um, we wanted to make sure that we develop plans for navigating all those challenges. And the more we do that, the more we're prepared, the less scary the future is because you've been thinking and you've been planning around what the possibilities are. And so I know I apologize for people in the back. You can always come up here if you'd like. <laughs> um, I, when I worked for the Futuring Think Tank, Joe Coates uh, was my boss. He was one of the original sort of founding futurists in the 70s. That's when Futuring became a really like, big thing. Um, and um, this was the, the chart that he basically gave us that was our, our training for thinking about the future. So when we were looking at a project, we were um, looking at a whole system. We were identifying all the elements in a system. We were thinking about driving forces. Um, and then we were starting to develop images of where we thought things could possibly go based on what we knew from the trends that we were seeing. And you use very different techniques for um, thinking about the future. So you can use scenario building, um, you can use uh, um, brainstorming surveys, casual models, historical analogy, an analogies, um, economic predictions, projections. There's a whole bunch of different things you can do. How many of you have done scenario building before? Anybody? Just a few? Good. Scenario building is a good way to think about possibilities. It's a really good technique. Um, the, the key here, though, this looks really messy and big, because all you have to do is pay attention. Really thinking about the future is paying attention and finding the opportunities. So the first thing is environmental scanning. How many of you have heard of environmental scanning before? Okay, good. So that's looking at everything, reading everything, paying attention to everything that's going on, watching things you don't normally watch. Um, how many of you have gone into uh, the library or into a bookstore and just picked up a bunch of different magazines, even things of, that you wouldn't normally pick up before? Anybody? Just a few people? Keep doing that because you'll start to see patterns. It's that patternicity piece. Um, I pick up everything. I'll pick up biker magazines, crocheting, um, entertainment magazines, gaming magazines, just about anything and just kind of flip through. And the more you do it, the more you'll start to see some really interesting patterns emerging. Uh, my husband is a, a musician and um, he gets a musician magazine and I was just sort of flipping through it. And they had a device so several years ago that was meant to be your, um, your digital device for inputting your notes. It was like an ebook, but for music instead. I thought, well, that's really kind of interesting. So it's watching the devices and seeing how different people are using them. Um, the thing that I think is most interesting, I've been talking about QR codes for a long time. How many of you are familiar with QR codes? QR codes? So QR codes are the, they're like funky little, um, they're not really barcodes, but they're little codes that have information embedded in them and you can use your smartphone to take a picture and then it takes you to more information, right? So you're probably seeing them in more places now. Um, they've been around for several years and um, I've always thought it'd be really cool for libraries to use them and I know Contra Costa is doing some experiments with um, QR codes and a lot of other libraries are. But the interesting thing about QR code is it, it blends virtual with real. So let me give you an example. Uh, a couple months ago I opened um, don't make fun of me, Lucky Magazine. Does anybody read Lucky? <laughs> yes, good, I'm not the only one. It's a shopping magazine. Um, it's a good place to search for, inf for information. It really is uh, to, to look at what's happening and what people want and use and need at the moment. Um, but what they're starting to do is put little QR codes in the magazine. So uh, there was a thing about your eyebrows and how you can make sure your eyebrows are perfectly trimmed and the right makeup. And it had just a little blurb about it, and then it said, if you want to know, if you want to see a video for how you can um, pluck your eyebrows, click on this QR code. And I pulled over my iPhone, and I clicked on the code, and sure enough, it took me right to a video about plucking eyebrows. So it's the merger of, of um, you know, real and not, and I'm starting to see that there's less content in Lucky. They're putting all their content in these QR codes. So Lucky now is many more images and prices, but the real content, which they would have told you years ago, like describing things and maybe showing things, are, is now in these QR codes that you're, you're using. So that's a pattern, that's a change. It's watching a technology and then seeing it 
and then seeing how it's being used, and then thinking about how do we, how do we use that in libraries. Um, having conversations. How many of you talk with each other about the future? Any of you? Few? Few people? What kinds of things do you talk about? I'm curious. <laughs> Are you a board kids college? Yeah. Maybe we won't be paying for college in the future. I don't know. Elsa? Sorry? Future Dewey? Yeah, absolutely. Because Dewey made it all for people to make it really easy to find information, right? <laughs> it works for us. But yeah. I heard one over here. Yeah, yeah. What is the what is the future of the tactile? Mm -hmm. Anything else? Yeah. How do we get access to more digital assets is a big question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So will everybody have some sort of device? Do we make sure everybody is connected with a device? Mm -hmm. um, my, my friend at work, uh, Jerry McGinnity, who's the chief of the Library Services Bureau, um, he was uh, telling his kids about, we had this new grant process we tried this year called Pitch an Idea. And we got 76 ideas. We thought we'd get like 40, we, but we had 76 phone calls <laughs> for a week and a half listening to ideas and talking with people about their ideas for grants. And it got to the point where he was calling it dialing for dollars. And <laughs> his kids were like, what do you mean, dialing? <laughs> <laughs> so what are going to be the things that we're doing now that won't mean something, you know, 10, 20 years from now? I saw a hand over here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's a good one. Yeah, it all relates. I mean, if you aren't thinking about China and what's happening in China, China is affecting, in will affect, everything that we do. So we can't keep just focusing local. We really do have to, as librarians, think very globally about all the changes that are happening. Um, and I highly recommend looking at what China's doing. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah, because they will have the digital machines and not cassette. Really? Hmm. I'm going to have to make a phone call. No, I hadn't heard that. Thank you for sharing that with me. No, I hadn't heard that. I'll have to talk with my, the folks at the Braille and Talking Book and see what they know. Fascinating. You know, and that's a systems thinking piece. Not figuring out the systems of how everything works. How are these people listening to things? A lot of them are using the machines that the state library provides. The Braille and Talking Book, um, just to add on to that, it has been moving to a digital format. The NLS, National uh, Library Services, has moved to digital. And they're no longer producing on the cassettes. They're producing now on the digital, like USB. There's like a little USB. It looks like it's in a tape case. And uh, we've had, we've been working to try to transition um, almost 12,000 people to a new device. And the average age is 71. And um, and the phone is the the most preferred way of communicating. So it's been very interesting. Yeah. I saw another hand. Did you have your hand up? Sorry. Yes. Yeah, it's coming. And even the end of Blu-ray, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's good to, the patterns, if you're watching the patterns of what's happening, so this is just my opinion, personal opinion about Blu-ray. It's short term. And why? Okay, DVD, short term, all of a sudden Blu-ray comes, and out here we already have Netflix and everything's streaming. So this is very short term right here. So even though I'd like to see what the special effects are on the Blu-ray now, I refuse to buy another device <laughs> and another format of every single movie I have. So 
it's paying attention to what's happening in the technology. It helps you figure out, which sometimes it's easier to figure out than other times, but, but the streaming part is where we're coming. The issue is going to be the bandwidth. Yes, in the back. Mm-hmm. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, there is nobody who totally collects everything to make it accessible to people. And I do think it is a role for accessibility. I mean, if you only have one kind of device, then having a format is important. It's how long and how many people are using that format that we have to pay attention to as, as we think of our collections. But, you know, records are coming back. There's a whole culture of records coming back. New record players are coming out. Um, people are making mixtapes. I mean, that's been a trend that's been, uh, it's this underground, you know, mixtapes. And, and so it's, and, and people are blending the two with digital as well. And so I think formats, is, we should pay attention to those and have them available to people personally. I also think libraries could be the place that if I found a, a floppy disk, I could come to the library and actually find something that I could save all that <laughs> stuff that's on that floppy disk because how many places can you go and find a Bernoulli box? Does anyone remember Bernoulli? Bernoulli disks are this big. <laughs> They're huge. You can't, you can't get that information anymore off of it. So um, I think formats and also are opportunities where we can, where, um, we can play. Um, the other, so that's the finding opportunities piece. And then the last is to act which is we can talk about it all day long, but actually trying things. And I think I, I hear what you're saying because it's like, well, do I get this or do I get this? How long do I wait? Should I buy the iPhone now or is the next iPhone coming out? You know, do I buy the I iPad now or do I wait till the next one comes out? And part of it is figuring out what is it you want to do, what do you want to try to do, <laughs> what do you want, have, want to have access to. But making those decisions is really, it's very difficult. Um, but we can't not do anything we kind of have to make decisions in libraries about what we're going to do. So that, that acting part is really important. Um, so I was at CES. Um, I'm going to turn the sound off. And I wanted to share a few things that I saw at CES. So here you have Paro. And he is um, a seal that is used in nursing homes to help comfort people. He's been out for a while. Um, for several years now, but I've been seeing him more. Um, and he was at um, the Consumer Electronics Showcase. And he interacts with you. He has sensors all over his body. And so when you pet him, he moves his head, he coos, his eyes blink. Um, the binky is his power source. So that's how, <laughs> that's how he's staying plugged in. Um, the one in the middle here is um, Pleo. How many of you, does anybody remember Pleo? He was out a couple of years ago. Um, but he is a highly intelligent artificial life. He comes out not really having a personality. And the more you interact with him, see how he's nuzzling him? He does nuzzle. I held him. I was like, oh my gosh, this is really weird. He nuzzles. He interacts with you. If you don't pay attention to him and you don't give him a lot of attention, he, he's shy. He won't engage with people. Um, when, he, uh, when he's really comfortable in order to conserve power, he'll fall asleep. So when I was holding the plio that I had, he was falling asleep, um, and he was conserving energy that way. But he was nuzzling like a cat. He was kneading on me with his, with his, <laughs> with his. I don't know what do you call dinosaurs' legs, <laughs> little paws. Um, and so, another really interesting artificial being. They're a little over four hundred dollars, and um, they're really pushing them for people who want to have pets but don't want to have all the cleaning and maintenance. Um, <laughs> and then the other one that we saw was, uh, there were a lot of these kind of, this is the dream bot, and the dream bot is a massage robot. So you can, you can lay on your stomach. We should have these in every library, right? Just lay down. <laughs> Just rolls on your back. <laughs> um, I went to the Consumer Electronics Showcase several years ago, and um, so I had a baseline for what I had seen like seven years ago. And there were way more robots now. Lots of robots interacting, kinds of pet or comfort, um, actually doing things. And then as we were um, walking around, uh, we found 
Let me turn the sound back on for this one. Okay. So these are robotics, like Swiffers, basically. And um, the company had, uh, had uh, done a little synchronized robot dance to Boom Boom Pow. <laughs> I think that'd be fun to have that cleaning my house. You know, turn on some music and then you have... Uh, So to me, what was interesting, well, one, it was that they synchronized robots. That was kind of cool. Um, but what was even more interesting to me is there was a whole section called Mommy Tech. And they were in Mommy Tech. There was not a lot of stuff in Mommy Tech. It really was focused around uh, taking care of your kids, so things to monitor your kids, things to uh, keep your kids healthy and safe. Uh, so there was this little Mommy Tech. And so what does mommy tech mean? Is there really a market for mommy tech? And ooh, is that an opportunity for us to do programs around moms and technology? We know lots of moms are buying Blackberries and using them for scheduling. Are there other kinds of things that we could think about in terms of parents or caregivers? It wouldn't just have to be mommy tech. But um, are there specific kinds of things? So I thought that was just kind of interesting as we were walking around. Um, there was a lot of solar. Solar was everywhere. Um, all kinds of panels and devices that you can buy, that you can uh, recharge your phone um, when you're camping or hiking or running or, or whatever. Um, and uh, really tiny, foldable light just fit, fit in your, your bag. And I was talking with um, uh, the, the Sherpa company and I said, do you ever talk to people in libraries about solar energy and how it works and how the cells work and why it's important. And he was like, we hadn't thought about that. Here's our marketing guy. Would you like to talk with him? <laughs> well, I think there's a role again to help educate people about everybody's hearing about um, green jobs. Well, what is a green job and what does a green job really mean? What is a photovoltaic cell? I mean, these are, there are new terms that are coming out that we're going to see more of this technology that people don't know about right now. And so, I think, again, more opportunities to think about there's a lot of solar. How do, we, how do we help people understand more? Because I think libraries really are about helping people understand so they can make better decisions. There were also a lot of um, new devices for managing your own energy usage in the home. And so devices that you just simply plug into the wall that through Wi-Fi talk to your computer and keep track of what's working and what's not and turning things off that need to be turned off to, um, to manage energy. So I think we're going to see a lot more of those kinds of devices as well. And then there was a lot of 3D, and this is 3D art, <laughs> which was kind of interesting. And 3D was everywhere. But I'm not, how many of you are convinced you need 3D in your home? Anybody? I don't know that I want to wear glasses. I already wear glasses all the time. I don't know that I need to wear them when I watch TV. I mean, like another set. I don't know how much 3D I need in my home. I think the device manufacturers were more excited about it than most of the people walking around. Because you can only see so many. I mean, some are a little bit more crisp than others. Some are, But I don't think they've figured out. There's not that tipping point yet for 3D in the home. Um, but it was everywhere. Um, and then, um, of course, there were e-books. And I'll tell you, there were a lot of e-books. <laughs> a lot <laughs> of e-books and a lot of uh, manufacturers producing um, devices for ebooks. So there were more than 40 devices coming out. So if you think about, we know Sony, we know Kindle, we know Nook. Uh, any other ones that you can think of? Nook, uh-huh. Yep, there's another one. iPad, sorry? Kobo. Kobo, mm-hmm. OK, well, add another 40 different kinds that are coming out. So um, the one that was, there were two that were interesting to me. And the one um, is this one over here. It's called the Book Keen, B-O-O-C-K-E-E-N. And it's a French company. And they produced a device. Um, it's very simple, um, easy to use. Uh, but they pack it with content in uh, English, French, Spanish, and German. And so you have classics, modern classics, and um, also some modern text that you get in this little ebook. 
So I liked the idea that the content was packaged. I thought that was kind of interesting. And there was a device that I couldn't, I mean, they ex we, we had to go back to them because we're like, why? We don't get it. Um, this clamshell device, half of it was e-ink and half of it was an LCD screen. So is everybody familiar with e-ink? E-ink is, okay. So e-ink is just really quick because um, it's a super smart technology where you have little tiny black balls, microscopic balls that are black and white, and when a charge goes across the screen, it pulls the ball up to be black or white to form the letters or the spaces on the page. What's good about it is it doesn't draw power. After the charge happens, it's not drawing power anymore. That is why the Kindle can last for so long and battery and some of the other e-ink devices. So they made it half e-ink and then half LCD and we're like, what is the point of having two? And they're targeting students who they figure will want to read and not have the strain of an LCD sometimes, but then they might want to go online and look at things while they're reading and cut and paste back and forth. I still didn't really buy it, but <laughs> it's an interesting idea. We'll see how, <coughs> how it works. But we're starting to see this. <coughs> mixing of formats and people trying to, to make things work. So for libraries, the real question is the content. We have to remain platform neutral. That is going to be the heart, that's the hardest part for us is the actual content piece. Um, Overdrive has the market right now. You have NetLibrary, the eBrary, and um, there are a couple of other vendors. You, know, you, know, you have the free um, like Internet Archive, Project Gutenberg. But <coughs> we have to make sure that um, not only are we kind of aware of these devices, because how many of you have had people ask you for help using your ebook? Anybody? Oh, yeah. So you're now free technical support for these devices, which is really interesting to me. <laughs> um, but now you have 40 more that could be walking through your door. So um, we have to think about who we talk to and how we talk to them about making sure that libraries have access to the content regardless of what device people use. Um, how many of you have an iPad? Do you read on your iPad? Yeah, and I'm sure you use more than one reader. You have like the Kindle and then, I have Kindle Nook and some other things, and then you can also download <coughs> books. So that's, that's really kind of the big issue. And um, COSLA, which is the chief operating officers of um, all the states, it's all the state librarians, they meet every year, um, started talking about eBooks and um, one of the li librarians from Oregon, Jim Shepke, said, let's, let's start figuring out how state librarians can play a role in some of these issues around ebooks. And so um, we did a, a feasibility study with a company out of, um, out of uh, Oregon, out of Portland, um, and it included from the state librarian side of Jim Shepke from Oregon, myself, uh, Joe Butler, who is now in Kansas, and uh, Rob Mayer, who is the State Librarian of Massachusetts, and then Tom Peters, who's a consultant, um, does a lot of writing and um, really big on technology, and then um, the, the company with Dwayne King, uh, Eva Miller, and Diane Case, who um, spent <coughs> a, a good amount of time interviewing all kinds of people, um, manufacturers of devices, uh, content people, you name it, and um, came up with some scenarios around what we need to think about in libraries to start the conversation. And I don't know how many of you have seen the COSLA eBook feasibility study. Has anybody seen it? Just a few people. Okay, good. If you haven't seen it, I, I have the URL. I'll just put it at the bottom. Um, but the, the real thing was to share what people are thinking about right now and what are the things that we should think about as possible things that libraries could do. And so there are about seven scenarios um, that go from creating one giant library of ebooks that we all collect and share uh, to libraries being test beds for, for technology. Um, it's a variety of different um, possibilities. And I, actually, if you just do COSLA, just Google COSLA feasibility study, you can also um, get to the scenarios. Um, so we looked at these scenarios, and COSLA right now is trying to figure out um, what our role is and what we can do to advocate for for access, because our vision is that all Americans have access to content no matter what format it's in. That's the vision. So um, we're very concerned that some publishers are thinking about producing only e-content that you have to pay for, which cuts out a lot of people from access to content. And we want to make sure that doesn't happen. And we want to make sure that they understand the issues around um, people finding and using uh, e-books. 
there's a notion by publishers that they actually lose money if they work with libraries. I am not sure that's true. So Basler right now, uh, in conjunction with the University of Washington, has an IMLS grant um, that we've submitted uh, to do a study on what is the ecosystem, the e-reading ecosystem, and um, what is the role that libraries do play in trying to really get at what is the reality of what libraries contribute to whether or not people buy content or not. And so that's one thing that COSL is doing out of this study. Another thing that we've just recently done is a, a person called us <coughs> from California uh, and said, I'm really interested in producing a de device for libraries. Um, that's a, just for libraries. I, and at first I was kind of like, well, I don't think the device is really a big issue, but if we're just thinking about making sure everybody has access, let's say, let's, if this guy's interested, let's talk with him. So we just recently talked, um, the, this, the group, Rob Mayer and um, Vin Shepke and myself uh, with this uh, gentleman, and he's, we've kind of come to the idea that he's going to actually put together a business plan, and we're gonna figure out how do we fund something to do a test on um, a, a library only kind of reader. So I'm not sure what will happen with it, but we're trying to dive in into different ways. And we know that OverDrive is also talking with lots of vendors right now to have devices that support um, their content. And I've talked with Steve Potash, and he doesn't have a problem if we created something also connecting to his content. So libraries that would have OverDrive would still be able to use whatever we, whatever's designed. So we're trying to get into that a little bit. And then in May, the state librarians will be meeting and having a, a very focused, facilitated discussion on sort of next steps on what we need to do. Who, who are the publishers we need to talk with? What is the message? And um, we're working closely with ALA, who also has a group. So everybody's working on it. <laughs> then there's the digital library group that's out of um, the East Coast. So <clears throat> we are trying to take steps to figure out what it looks like. And in the meantime, at the state, um, we are working with um, BookFlix, which I don't know how many of you have heard of BookFlix, but it's uh, children's books. Um, we're negotiating a statewide contract, so everybody in the state of California will have access to BookFlix. So I'm very excited, and we're hoping to launch late spring with that. So that's another thing we're, we're working on. So as we think about the future, um, I like this quote, quote a lot. It's from the author of The Little Prince, and that's, um, as for the future, your task is not to foresee it, but to enable it. And I think that we can do that every day if we just pay attention and we support our communities really well. So thank you very much for allowing me to be here with you today. And I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Um, have you heard any talk on libraries and augmented reality? And where can libraries find programmers for mobile apps? Oh, that's such a good question. So um, augmented reality, I am sure there are libraries that are doing something with it right now. I'm not aware of the ones that are. I know that there are apps that you can play with right now to start investigating that, like layers um, from, from, the, um, from the App Store to the Apple Store. Um, there are some really interesting apps that I just downloaded, one for San Francisco, in fact, um, that is called um, Time Shutter. I don't know if anybody has seen that one. Uh, what's really cool about Time Shutter, it's not quite augmented reality, but it's, it's almost there. But basically, they have postcards of major um, or historic photos of major buildings across San Francisco. And when you double tap on it, it shows you a picture of today. It changes and transforms. And you can take that and hold it. You can stand in the same spot and hold it up and also see it, and then take your own picture and add it to the, to the collection. So um, it's not, it's, it's sort of the beginnings of that, and it's a local company, actually. I think we should all contact them. <laughs> um, but, um, you know, I don't have any examples, and does anybody else, has anybody heard of any libraries doing augmented reality? I haven't, oh, yeah. Hello, um, I heard that San Jose is um, working with, uh, well, they've got a grant um, to actually do like a, a walking history tour of downtown San Jose, and it's going to be augmented reality. So they're working on it, I heard. Very cool. Um, it would be really interesting, too, if you had sort of uh, augmented reality with maybe if we, 
if we wanted to uh, augment paper that might be changing, if you were reading a book, you could have a, a character. You could augment it with an actual character, maybe reading the lines or saying certain lines. Um, I think there are lots of ideas. I don't know how much we've been doing, though. Um, when you were talking about the Lucky Magazine and the use of QR codes, yeah. you said you liked that it was a merger of the real and the not real. Yeah. Which was real? <laughs> I think the more that I can touch. So the merger, the content being here versus in some other location. Yeah, thank you for clarifying. Yeah. I don't know, some of it's not real because I'm not 18. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Deborah Doyle. I'm the chair of the California Library Association Legislative and Advocacy Committee, and I wanted to follow up on Stacy's report on the budget because she can only give you information, but I can tell you, I can tell you what they're thinking up there a little bit. Um, uh, a lot of library advocates, library directors, uh, have been meeting with um, with the the budget sub budget subcommittees. They've been testifying in front of the budget subcommittees, meeting all of the legislators. And there's actually a bipartisan shock that all of the library funding was eliminated, which means you still have time to write those letters, send those emails, especially to your own legislators. They have to hear from you as individuals and as professionals that this money is critical. I mean, I think we're going to get some of that money restored into the budget. Uh, you know, then the next fight is with the governor. But I think we really have to continue to push. So if you haven't, and if people ask you what they can do, tell them by all means. Send them to the CLA website. Have them call anybody in the leadership. Um, really, this is critical, critical. And, and this isn't the last. We have to think about next year, too. So really, if you don't usually get political, this is the time to get political. Thanks. And we have heard comments. Thank you. We have heard comments um, from um, assembly members who who have said, "Oh, I have a hundred letters about this already." So they are counting the the letters that are sent. They're paying attention to what people are saying. Yeah. yeah. Hi. Um, I had a question for you about. You're familiar with the fact that San Francisco Public Library was not able to implement RFID. Yes. Um, and it was contentious. And mm -hmm. what is your take on that as a futurist? Have we, I mean, does that hobble us extraordinarily for what you see coming in the next five to 10 years? Is there some next technology that you think we should be looking toward? What's, what's your thought on SFPL's current place and where we can go with that RFID restriction? So RFID is really interesting to me. Um, in many ways, it's an old technology because businesses have been using it, but in many ways, it's still a little expensive for the tags. And the tags have so much memory on them, but we're not using all the memory on them. So it seems it's a nice um, way of making things easier and, and safer, potentially, in your library from, from walking. But I don't know it's, if it's the end-all, be-all of, of technologies right now. Um, I have to say I haven't really been thinking about other technologies that could be used instead of RFID. I don't think it hobbles you. It just, it, it just puts you in a place where you, you can't maybe manage as easily as you could have you know, with, with older technologies. Um, I think even newer technologies, anything that has um, potential information on it, people are starting to get really concerned about. You know, we were talking about nobody cares about privacy. Well, now it's kind of doing an upswing because today on the front page was that uh, California so Appeals Appellate, was it the Appellate Court, decided that you can't ask, stores can't ask for your zip code. And um, in a, because it's a privacy issue because they can make connections for data. And so um, on the analysis on the radio this morning, I heard that there could be more data that we are seeing that people will not be able to ask us for. And so any technology that enables information access and somebody can filch that information, I think is always going to be an issue for us. But we have to figure out ways to um, uh, explain the benefit versus what is actually happening. I mean, the books themselves, the only thing people filch is what title you have. I mean, they can't get to anything else from that at this point. 
but I think we have to pay close attention to those issues around what is it that people have access to, and then we have to educate people about what that really means. Um, and sometimes it's not just the information piece, but I think it's also the, um, the technology scares people. Um, but you know, in other countries, they're already paying for things with their cell phones. They're already, and there are cases that you buy for your phones that people can't can't interfere and, and download what's on your phone. So it's already out there. It's the future's already here. It's just even, in, unevenly distributed. Um, in you know, uh, quote. Um, so uh, I think we have to sort of look at what I would recommend doing really is looking at what is what's happening in Japan and Singapore and China and Asia right now, what technologies they're using to maintain and coordinate um, their content and how they're accessing information. And if you pay attention to the trends of what they're doing, those things tend to come, come this way. So, another question? Over here? Oh, over here? Um, is there anything uh, being done to address the ebook copyright laws that leave libraries out in the cold with certain titles which are exclusive? Well, it's, um, you know, the copyright is, is really interesting to me because um, I think we're having a conversation about, around, about now, about content. What is, what is content? How long should you really own content? Um, how much should content cost? <laughs> and um, the copyright we're paying attention to right now it's really the digital rights management. It's the containers that um, ebook content providers like Amazon use that lock us out. So um, Kindle has, uh, and Amazon uses a particular container. Nook and Barnes and Noble, they have another container. It's all of these digital rights management containers that we have to figure out a way to create the win-win for the um, content publishers to, to change that digital rights so that it opens up to multiple devices and allows us to make it accessible, but at the same time doesn't impinge upon somebody's right to, to make money or to have their rights preserved with copyright. So we're really looking at those, con those uh, the digital rights management containers and trying to figure out how we can make those work better. <coughs> Thank you very much. It was good to see you all today. Oh, one more thing. One more thing I promised Alan. <laughs> um, for those of you who have friends and foundations and uh, that you know, um, foundation members, Caltech is having their annual workshops. The first one is on February 26th. It's at Milipedis Public Library. And Saturday, the March 12th at um, Monrovia, if you want to take a trip. So thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Okay, let's give her, Stacy one more round. I'm sh so thank you again, Stacy, for coming down from Sacramento. Oh, we appreciate you. it. And please do write your legislator. We really, they really are counting. That's what we're hearing. They're counting the number of letters they get. Doesn't matter what you say necessarily. Just get those letters there. So uh, one thing that we can help our state library with. So uh, I'm sure Stacey will stay around for a few minutes if somebody wa want to come down and talk with her. So thanks again for coming and see you next month.